Well, ladies and gentlemen, colleagues, um, thanks very much for uh, coming back so promptly. Um, just to say a few words to introduce the next session, which is called Civility and the Arts. Um, the arts, as we know, are a vital part of our society, but what does it do for us? What do they do for us? And this session is going to explain how the arts help to promote acceptance, understanding and respect, and how powerful the role of creativity is towards building and fueling uh, social and sustainable societies. And I'm very pleased to introduce our, the chair of today's session, uh, Rosalind Dundas, who's uh, from the Australian Dance Council, Ausdance. And Ros commenced the CEO of the Australian Council Dance Council, Ausdance, in, in January 2013, having previously held the position of Ausdance ACT Director uh, between 2005 and 2007. She spent several years reviewing dance for the Canberra Times and has a long personal commitment to this art form. Uh, Ausdance is the peak body here for dance education, uh, inspi dance educating, inspiring and supporting the dance community to reach its potential as a dynamic force in local, national and international communities. Rosalind's also been director of the ACT Council of Social Service, the peak body for not-for-profit social welfare and community agencies in the ACT, was a member of the ACT Legislative Assembly, being at that time the youngest woman ever elected to a parliament in Australia. That was in 2001. She's a graduate member of the Australian Institute of Company Directors and has a BA in History and Political Science from the ANU. She's also volunteered as a board member for a range of organisations, including being president of the YWCA of Canberra, vice president of the YWCA of Australia, and treasurer of the Canberra Arts Marketing. And currently, in addition to her many other roles, she's deputy chair of the World YWCA Nominations Committee. Rosalind, over to you. Thank you very much for that kind introduction. I'm hopeful that you all enjoyed your morning tea. And while you were in the space uh, of Parliament House and out in the theatre foyer, perhaps reflecting on our next topic of civility and arts and the topic we just had about democracy and arts, this building in and of itself is a piece of artwork. Uh, it was constructed to reflect some of the historical parliaments that exist around the world, but also to uh, be more creative in the use of space. And I've, I worked in this building for six months, a long time ago, and it's a very large building, a building very easy to get lost in. But I found myself navigating the corridors based on the artwork that I saw. I knew I turned left at the caged emu, I went right at the floral painting, Finally, I'd taken the time to learn who was actually doing uh, these paintings. But everywhere you go in this building, there are reflections of Australian art on all of the walls, even in the carpet, uh, across the entire building. And just recently, as part of the centenary of Canberra celebrations, the Australian Ballet turned this building into a dance, a dance performance choreographed by Gary Stewart reflecting very much the uh, monumental status of a building, but also its artistic nature. So as we talk about civility and arts, I think we can reflect on the broader concept of art and the broader concept of civility and how they come together. We'll be looking at creativity and we'll be looking at respect. Our key focus for conversation is what does art do for us? And how do arts promote acceptance, understanding and respect for the pursuit of common good? Arts, unlike democracy and sport, as we've been talking about, doesn't require competition. It can be in itself competitive, but it doesn't necessarily have those opposing sides two sword lengths apart, as we do in Parliament. It is, in fact, across art forms that we have long histories, long histories of lineage, of talking about mentors, of talking about uh, those who have gone before and taught us more about ourselves as we continue to grow and teach us more about ourselves as a community. And interestingly, although not surprisingly for a chess forum, all of our speakers on this topic have been trained in the art of education. Song Room, an organisation based in Victoria that provides support and services for arts education, undertook a study recently on school achievement and looking at how to bridge gaps uh, in educational outcomes that arise from social economic differences through 
the arts and they found that participation in arts programs is associated with psychological indicators growing, such as resilience, self-regulation, self-esteem, identity, self-concepts, self-efficiency, motivation, and the ability to experience flow. Participating in arts programs in schools was actually found to bridge the education gap and support young people to do better across the other disciplines in their school. And whether we consciously understand the benefits Many of us participate in the arts, whether we know it or not. Uh, taking on a bit of dance activity at the end of a long day as we boogie around our bedrooms, singing to the mirror, drumming out a beat with our fingertips are all expressions of creativity. 10 million Australians attended AFL in a year. Over 11 million attended a visual arts or craft exhibition. We spoke earlier about the growth of social media. 1.2 million Australians are on Twitter, but over 2 million participate in craft activities. Arts are very dominant in Australia, but not necessarily something that we talk about. So that's why we're going to talk about it right now and how it fits in with the concept of civility. Our first speaker is Paula Abood, a community cultural development worker writer, educator and filmmaker who has worked with culturally diverse communities over the past 26 years. She is going to discuss with us the power of community cultural engagement as a way towards transformative change through the voicing and sharing of stories. So please make Paula feel welcome. Thank you. I would like to acknowledge the Ngunnawal and Ngambri people on whose land we meet today and pay my respects to the elders past and present and especially pay my respects um, to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people here, peoples here today. Um, when I first was thinking about this idea, civility in the arts, you know, as a, an educator and community worker and working with people from culturally diverse backgrounds, language for me is really important. One, first to unpack what words mean on the surface and underneath. And civility is, is a word, you know, we use, I guess, in many, many different ways. And for me as a community worker, I often engage with the uncivil because community work really is about um, building communities. And so I see in my context as a community-based culture worker, the civil civility for me is about building communities. And that's probably been a lot of my work area. How do we build communities, build relationships in communities that don't organically come together? And I guess the uncivil is often what comes into my head when I think about some of the work I've done. But even as the previous panel have articulated, the uncivil has been on public display, possibly because as well, you know, because everyone has a camera on their phone and on buses in Sydney and Melbourne, you, you might recall there have been incredibly uncivil um, episodes around cultural diversity or people from culturally diverse backgrounds that, you know, articulate it around race and power and racism. So today, I guess I want to look really through the lens of civility, arts and cultural diversity, because that has been my main area of work. and. I want to start with a quote um, from the intellectual and um, beautiful writer W.E.B. Du Bois, who writes, I quote, begin with art, because art tries to take us outside ourselves. It is a matter of trying to create an atmosphere and context so conversation can flow back and forth and we can be influenced by each other. I now want to take you to um, a couple of articles from the Universal Declaration on Cultural Diversity because I think this um, declaration underpins how, I guess, I approach the world I live in and I've worked for 26 years in Western Sydney with culturally diverse communities, particularly groups and communities who've been socially excluded, who've been marginalised, who live on the edges and the peripheries, if you like and whose voices are often silenced. Um, so the first article of uh, this declaration that was ratified uh, in 2001, or adopted in 2001, it 
the article one quotes, as a source of exchange, innovation and creativity, cultural diversity is as necessary for humankind as biodiversity is for nature. In this sense, it is the common heritage of humanity and should be recognised and affirmed for the benefit of present and future generations. Article 2 calls for, in our increasingly diverse societies, it is essential to ensure harmonious interaction among people and groups with plural, varied and dynamic cultural identities, as well as their willingness to live together. Policies for the inclusion and participation of all citizens are guarantees of social cohesion, the vitality of civil society and peace. Thus defined, cultural pluralism gives policy expression to the reality of cultural diversity. And I guess in, in terms of my work, um, this is very important because it's about participation and certainly community cultural development is what I would call a practice in civil society or the community sector where we bring communities together so they can participate and tell their stories. And for me, this is a really meaningful practice because it's how we might bring people from opposite ends of the spe spectrum to exchange in respectful reciprocity. And when people tell, in my experience of when people tell their stories, you become part of that story. So it's a different way of working with people so that they become active participants in building civil society in their own contexts. Article three, the final um, article I wanna read is cultural diversity widens the range of options open to everyone. It is one of the roots of development as a means to achieve a more satisfy satisfactory intellectual, emotional, moral and spiritual existence and I, really think all aspects of existence are important in terms of how we build civil society. John Hawkes, who wrote a landmark um, paper that's been adopted around the world um, called The Fourth Pillar of Sustainability, unpacks culture and how it might be a useful tool in building community and uh, certainly in, in encouraging and promoting and fostering civility. He defines uh, he sees culture as embodying the sense we make of our lives, built on the values we share and the ways we come to terms with our differences. Culture deals with what matters to people and communities. Culture is about relationships, memories, experiences, identities, backgrounds, hopes and dreams in all their diversity. It is with culture that we make the connections, the networks of meanings and values and friendship and interests that hold us together in time, in place and in society. For me, as a community cultural development worker, culture describes is a way and describes the way we tell each other our stories, how we create our sense of ourselves and how we remember who we are, how we imagine who we want to become, how we celebrate, how we argue, how we bring up our children, the spaces we make for ourselves. So community cultural development and storytelling work, because storytelling really is, um, I think, the underpinning principle and practice of community work. Um, as a community strengthen, strengthening tool, art br can bring people together. It can enable dialogue and promote understanding between different social and cultural groups. It can encourage respectful um, ways, respectful, I guess, interaction between peoples and traditions and values and can facilitate exchange of ideas and most importantly, build trust between individuals and communities. It has the capacity to engage people's creativity and develop critical thinking, which I think is really important if we're talking about civility. Um, encouraging questioning and opening up the imagination to possibilities to see things from a different perspective and offer alternative ways of being, of doing things. It, this can support renewal by drawing attention to the possibilities for change and of change, supporting people to explore visions for the future. The arts calls up a sense of humanity to deepen understanding, particularly around persistent issues of race, economic inequality and identity. 
in the complex dimensions of community life, social, civil, cultural, political. The flow of conversation back and forth is essential to understanding and accountability. Certainly dialogue or dialogic processes are vital to building community. Opportunities for dialogue are embedded in or connected to the arts experience. Arts can participate in and help, con help create conditions to embody meaningful and productive civil dialogue. Thus, our st they're our stories. Dialogue, like art, is inherently risky. Understanding the conditions that make people feel unsafe or safe is paramount to deep and meaningful dialogue. I just want to say one last quote um, and then show you a little digital story because I actually want to invoke civility via a story. Um, this quote is by um, Pam Causer, Andrea Asaf and Barbara Schaefer-Bacon, who say, Art is effective bef because it explores what is unresolved or in conflict between people or even within an individual. Art can humanise civic issues, bringing forward the human impact and implications. Often this is an emotional journey and it can be difficult to switch from the intense emotion of the artistic experience to the rational response often expected in civic dialogue. And thus, artists, arts and culture workers, poets, storytellers, dancers, performers, writers, musicians are important members of our community because they enrich the lives and capacities of all of us, especially children and young people. They are often our community leaders, our healers. They teach us, they make us think, they challenge us to be better. They play a critical role in encouraging dialogue and that exchange I've mentioned. Um, last quote, <laughs> Bar Barack Obama um, in 2009 um, reflected on art and national life and I quote his words, the arts are not somehow apart from national life. The arts are at the heart of national life. In times of war and sacrifice, the arts and artists remind us to sing and to laugh and to live. In times of plenty, they challenge our conscience and implore us to remember the least among us. In moments of division or doubt, they compel us to see the common values that we share, the ideals to which we aspire, even if we sometimes fall short. In days of hardship, they renew our hope that brighter days are still ahead. I want to now um, play a short story for you from a project we did.
Thank you, Paula, and thank you for sharing uh, that very powerful uh, story at the end. I think it's uh, important for us to reflect, as Paula said, that in hearing a story, we become part of the story and the role of the audience or the receiver in art and how that does really uh, make the civil society because it is a two-way. Uh, art doesn't happen in isolation. It does need, some argue, but I argue, some need an, an audience to actually be part of the artistic process. And in hearing that story, we became part of that story. Our next presenter is Adrian Bogue, and she's program coordinator at the National Gallery of Australia with responsibility for developing access programs for youth and the community. She has over 20 years teaching experience in tertiary and museum visual art education and currently coordinates regular tours for a wide variety of specialised audiences, including people with dementia, and is the facilitator, facilitator of the Arts and Alzheimer's programs at the National Gallery of Australia here in Canberra. She will discuss with us that program and uh, arts and dementia more broadly. Please welcome Adriana. Good morning, everyone, and thank you very much, Roslyn. I would also like to acknowledge the Ngunnawal and Ngambri peoples on whose land we meet and to pay respect to their elders, both past and present, and to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples here today. The Art and Alzheimer's program, is this right? I don't know, you always feel that it's too close. You can hear? Yep, thank you. The Art and Alzheimer's Program was initiated at the National Gallery of Australia in 2007 and has developed since then to include a national outreach program. I want to use this, Art and Alzheimer's, as an example of the importance of the arts and how they can benefit our lives and how the arts promote acceptance, understanding and respect. The Art and Alzheimer's Program has had a broad impact on the NGA, from the director to the learning and access staff and even to the security team. It has received national and international recognition for its leadership and innovation, its engagement with a new audience, and the connections it makes between arts and health. The program has brought new partnerships, skills, and opportunities for the gallery to fulfill its national mandate. And the program has been life-affirming and inspiring for everybody connected to it. The Art and Alzheimer's program operates within a framework of established access programs, including sign interpreted and descriptive tours, tours for people with physical or intellectual disabilities, and also for carers. The success of each of these is dependent on community-based partnerships and sometimes personal contacts established over time. In this way, audience development has occurred primarily outside the gallery's usually mar usual marketing channels. It wasn't until the last 10 years or so that museums and galleries in Australia have begun to develop awareness and policies of social inclusion. An understanding of the physical requirements of diverse audiences needs to be supported by an understanding of the value of people of all abilities being able to participate in the world independently. A holistic view of health, which includes spiritual, mental and physical well-being, has promoted the growth of an arts and health field between two areas once regarded as separate. The arts and health model measures the well-being of individuals and communities through participation in arts. The arts allow us to communicate our experience of life, make meaning of this experience and to imagine the future. And just before we started, Paula and I were talking about our respective talks and I said, you'll do a big framework and I'll almost be like a case study. So I thank you very much for her talk. If there are 100 billion stars in the Milky Way, then imagine them as cells in your brain. Dementia is an umbrella term and describes a set of over 100 symptoms which result in a range of degenerative effects. The program at the NGA is called Art and Alzheimer's because of the high incidence of Alzheimer's in the diagnosis of dementia, about 70%. At the moment, dementia is incurable. For people living with dementia, life expectancy is around 12 years. When Chris, a long-term participant in the Art and Alzheimer's program, was diagnosed with dementia in 2008 at the age of 56, he thought his life was over. Each time he visited the gallery, he would cry. When he was interviewed in 2010, he made this statement. 
It reinforced a comment made by his partner, Judy, that there is life after a diagnosis of dementia. Chris's journey from the anxiety and depression that had accompanied his original diagnosis was to a rekindled enjoyment of life. It's a powerful story. People living with dementia like Chris are vulnerable. Dementia can make a person unrecognisable to not just family and friends, but to themselves. And there is a deep psychological pain felt in response to the awareness of what is happening and what will happen in the future. Works of art provide a vehicle to express deeply felt emotion, to share the journey, to learn, and to actively engage in life now. Often programs for people with dementia, and particularly Alzheimer's disease, focus on memory. Yet it is in the area of personal memory and recall that people with dementia are most stressed. The work of art focuses the participants in the present, a free-flowing discussion where participants respond to each other and where there is time for observation, description, interpretation and connection, encourages participants to express their optimum capabilities. As a result of the knowledge and understanding gained and the process of acceptance of a work of art, positive emotion and feelings of well-being are generated. A few weeks ago, I introduced my regular group to a painting by American artist Robert Ryman called Arena. Arena appears to be a blank canvas. It is, in fact, a large square of linen painted white. It's actually, the surface is quite beautiful. Over the course of 20 minutes, skepticism was replaced by a grudging admiration and then enjoyment of the playful and challenging nature of a painting where there's ostensibly nothing to see. Gerard, one participant, made the point that although he forgets many things, the works of art he discusses in the gallery somehow imprint themselves in his mind. Imance Tiller's painting, Mount Analog, on the screen, connects with the aims of the Art and Alzheimer's program for me because the title refers to a book about a journey, a journey that is never completed. The image is both divided and coherent. I imagine the way each small canvas board joins its neighbour is like the dementia-affected brain, with its connections and pathways disrupted. Despite the disjunction, we can still read Tiller's painting as a whole, and this is true of my experience with people living with dementia. Connections are ruptured, but not completely lost. Time and patience, actively listening and gesture, provide the space for people with dementia to communicate. In the Responsive Museum, published in 2006, Ian Blackwell and Sarah Scaife suggest how a mental health model can be applied in a museum context. They define four elements which connect to both art and mental health, and they are embodiment, that you feel a match between who you are and the physical body that you live in, unity, that you experience yourself as a single coherent whole, agency, you are your own and have at least some control over your own life, and continuity, you have a sense of your own story as a continuous thread that runs throughout your life. Two participants demonstrated the relevance of this model during the pilot program. On separate occasions, Mike and George, George spontaneously expressed their sense of loss of self. The works of art were not selected for, this, for this, such a discussion in mind. In fact, Mike stopped the group in front of the painting on the left by Herbert McClintock as we were moving through the gallery. That's how I feel, that's me, he said. Moments like these are transforming. They unite the group because they articulate the experience of living with dementia and it is important that they're expected and acknowledged. These comments stay with me. They reinforce the importance of educators to be attuned and sensitive to participants and also brave and open in themselves. For people with dementia, a book or a film can be difficult to process because the narrative unfolds over time. By contrast, a work of art is often static, the meaning contained within a set of parameters that are all revealed sim simultaneously, but which may require time to interpret. On the right is a drawing made in response to the painting by Grace Cosington Smith. Richard wrote, a lonely road which has been seldom used. The telephone lines are the only connections with people. You can see how his drawing doesn't fill the page, how small and isolated it appears, and also the sentiment that he expresses, 
and it's quite different from the friendly mood of Grace Cobbington Smith's painting. It took about a year of discussion during 2006 before the gallery felt ready to implement a training program for educators in this field. The very first discussions included Alzheimer's ACT and an important partnership was established. In 2007, a six week pilot program was begun and its success, based, um, and its success was based on a strong sense of collaboration between the educators and the 16 participants, the healthcare providers and families. Clinical psychologist Dr. Mike Bird and his team from the Southern Area Health Service based in Queanbeyan evaluated the pilot program using video and digital recordings of the conversations. Dr. Bird's conclusion cited how the program reinforces the importance of providing interventions that promote, higher, that promote normal, higher level activities for people with dementia. The evaluation was published in 2009 in the Interna International Journal Aging and Mental Health, if any of you are interested. And that leads us, I suppose, really nicely to the aims of the program. There's been a little bit of discussion this morning about social inclusion, the need for people to participate and to be visible in the community. How important it is, even when faced with a disease that produces cognitive decline, that we are allowed um, the uh, luxury or the liberty of learning. Uh, people with dementia often behave aggressively. Their behaviour is seen as difficult and unpredictable. And I found, well, actually we've had very little inc uh, instance of this at the gallery, but I think that it's often because people feel isolated, that they're unheard that they're frustrated at their lack of ability to communicate. The idea that we should promote within the general public, I think there is a lot of anxiety about dementia and about how it affects people. How will you deal with somebody has, ha, who has dementia? So that idea of promoting understanding, of um, making sure that the programs are conducted during the gallery's opening hours are really important. This is just a couple of shots of different uh, models of the tours that we have in the gallery. So each tour lasts for 45 minutes to an hour. The tours are discussion based, three to four works of arts are selected and the numbers are limited to four to six participants. And the participants are given reproductions of the works of art to take home to kind of extend the discussion and the experience of being in the gallery. In 2010, a grant from the Department of Health and Aging enabled the gallery to establish an outreach program and to develop a two-day training workshop. Initially, three regional centres were selected, but since then, additional support from a private foundation and a partnership through Museums and Gallery Services Queensland, the program has been significantly extended. These two works from the Decorative Arts Collection demonstrate the power of the aesthetic experience and the importance of beauty in our lives. On one memorable occasion, a group of women discussed what a difference having a lamp or a teapot like the ones pictured would make to their lives in residential care. Everyone would visit me, said Alma. I just couldn't get over that for weeks afterwards and I went home and, you know, and I lectured my children on how they should value the fact that they live in a home where a lot of attention is paid to their environment, where the aesthetic quality of their environment is, um, uh, uh, is valued. Um, and it reinforced for me this, this comment by Alma, the importance of not only the works of art but the visit to the gallery the social aspects centred around and within beauty. If the arts promote well-being and increase quality of life for people living with dementia through acceptance, understanding and respect, then they support the resilience of individuals. People with dementia are facing a huge challenge. The Art and Alzheimer's program affirms the importance of the arts to cross boundaries and to connect us all. Thank you. Thank you, Adrian, for that uh, highlighting the, the program that runs at the National Gallery and also how uh, each of the bits of that program or each of the bits of a community in and of themselves are valuable. They join together 
there are connections that then make something bigger, but each individual by themselves is also an important part of the overall picture. Whether we apply that to individuals, whether we apply that to a piece of art, to a particular program, there are a number of little bits that make up the whole. And it's important, I think, when we talk about society to remember that that then breaks down to individuals. Our next speaker has, uh, Tony Graborski, has for the past five weeks, and five weeks only, been CEO of the Australia Council, the Australian Government's Arts Funding and Advisory Body. He has been with the Australia Council for slightly longer than five weeks, starting there in 2007 as Executive Director of Arts Organisations Division and was recently elevated to the CEO role. He spent many years in arts administration, working with orchestras and in the music field, including as General Manager of the, Art Youth the Australian Youth Orchestra. Tony will be addressing our theme of arts and civility and the key questions that we are, are looking at and how arts help build a civilised society. Please make him welcome. Thank you. It's terrific to be here. I um, um, thanks to Chas for the uh, for the invitation. I remember attending a couple of years ago, um, and when the the topic was um, social and demographic change in society, and um, it had such a profound effect on my thinking, actually, in my work in in the arts, and for arts managers to sort of be involved in in these types of forums, it's um, it's uh, it's it's very important. So thanks to Chas for the uh, for, for the invitation. It's also great to see the guys from uh, from. Canberra Grammar, I think, who are also participating today. So it's um, that, that's terrific. Um, so to be, um, I've been in the role for um, for just uh, just over a month, but um, you know, 25 years in the arts. So um, and in the vast sweep of arts that that we see through the uh, through the Australia Council, the artists, it's to foster and promote creativity that underscores its value to society is nothing short of a great privilege. But as I sort of get my feet under the desk, going through a time of significant change at the Australia Council, in preparing my remarks today, it's been really timely to pause and consider more deeply the role that the arts play in contributing to the way that we live, the way that we see ourselves, the way that we relate to each other, the development and maintenance of our values, and the role of the arts in enriching our social fabric. From the earliest cave paintings to the most edgy digitally enabled works, the arts are the most profound expression of thinking and imagination. A man called Professor Pierre Massimo Forni uh, founded the Civility Initiative at Johns Hopkins University. And among his works is a book called The Thinking Life. And a quote from that book um, is, I think, really interesting. Maybe most of us find life precious because the thought the sooner or later it ends is never far from us. We are like visitors to a Renaissance chapel looking at a remarkable painted canvas on the walls as the lighting timer we activated ticks away. If we agree that life is important, then thinking as we go through it is the basic tribute we owe it. It also happens to be the golden way to the good life, the kind of life in which happiness blooms. The motive to create work, works of art, can be anything from simple unleashing individual creative expression to challenging, stimulating, delighting, educating, or any or all of the above. But more and more, the power to harness the arts as agents of positive social change is emerging as what some might call a higher purpose in artistic practice. The role of the arts as an agent for social change goes back at least to the first political cartoons in Renaissance Italy with a direct line to the Reformation, with Martin Luther's realization that powerful images were able to move the illiterate masses against what he saw as corruption in the church. Since the 90s, critics and curators have broadly accepted the notion that participatory art is the ultimate political art, that by encouraging an audience to take part, an artist can promote new kinds of social relations. Only a few days ago, I noticed on the World Policy Institute blog had a piece about the forthcoming mayoral elections in New York. The author pointed to the opportunity to use the open mayoral race as an opportunity to press for a cultural policy that would work for social equity. And she said, cultural change precedes and embodies political change. Thus, fostering arts and culture in the community needs to be an essential part of progressive agenda for empowerment and change. Drawing upon the ingenuity of our, uh, in our neighbourhoods and how stories and relationships give meaning to people's lives will help the city reimagine itself from the grassroots. 
Change is about engaging hearts as well as minds. An agenda that doesn't recognise these stakes early will certainly fail. At a local level, we at the Australia Council have worked to support many initiatives whose focus is creating a better and more civilised society. We've recently in, in, uh, had a number of international visitors in Australia who've engaged us in a conversation about the role of art in social justice. Thought leader from the United States, Diane Ragsdale, who visited us recently to share international examples, like the Santa Cruz Museum, that is transforming the museum into a space for communities to connect and reinvent how they understand themselves. Claire Bishop is another commentator and innovator who we hosted last year. Her work has charted the social turn in art in recent years and the rise in participatory and social art projects. It has highlighted the pioneering work of arts, artists as interpreters and facilitators of thought and dialogue about the social upheaval caused by technological and economical change. It's been stimulating and exciting to develop these international connections, but some of the best examples are actually homegrown. And locally in Sydney, a couple of years ago, the National Institute for Experimental Art was founded, built on research strengths in digital media, social, environmental and community-based application of the arts. Its aim is to produce internationally leading research that addresses national priorities and global problems, including environmental sustainability, digital and frontier technologies, indigenous culture and intercultural relations. They're doing some breathtaking work uh, and research. Arguably, the emergence of Aboriginal visual arts, as what Robert Hughes called the last great art movement of the 20th century, has done more to highlight the disadvantage of Aboriginal Australia than anything since the 1967 referendum. The Australia Council has supported Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander arts since we began. Our support for Indigenous artists, organisations and communities ranges across Australia and some good examples include Black Arm Band's work supporting professional Indigenous musicians who are performing and engaging with remote communities, both here in Australia and around the world. Gadigal in Redfern has also provided a voice and platform for the urban Indigenous experience. It has also supported connections, pathways and social justice for Indigenous communities in and across um, Sydney as well as helping Indigenous Australians in cities connect to homelands. We've recognised and funded community arts and cultural development as an art form for over 30 years. Some of the work is pioneering in the world and our support and investment has allowed a wide range of creative and community-led responses to social issues with artistic outcomes. We have, for, in for instance, supported a range of initiatives to support social recovery in disaster-affected communities in recognition of the growing body of evidence that shows the benefits of the arts to personal and community wellbeing including how the arts can support community connections in post-disaster situations and can help people to recover from these traumatic events. A project illuminated by fire was a project developed after the 2009 Black Saturday bushfires, which involved local artists working with affected communities across regional Victoria and our investment in Creative Recovery Arts Corp in the wake of hurricane and flood disasters in Queensland in 2011 has similar um, impacts and benefits. We have also, after several years, supported projects to enable expression and encourage understanding within and between our culturally diverse communities. And a recent example, No Added Sugar, an exhibition that was the culmination of a three-year engagement supported by us and the Australian Human Rights Commission. This project supported Muslim women artists to engage with local communities in the creation of new work that was exhibited at the Kasula Powerhouse Arts Centre last July. It was in part a response to research done by the Human Rights Commission that recognised the exclusion faced by sections of our community. The arts intervention provided a space for the groups involved to come together, explore their challenges and create artwork that enabled them to express their culture and experiences. It is just but one example, and there are many, many more, that the Australian Council has tried to provide an important avenue of support for arts practitioners, certainly like my co-panellist Paul, Paula. As most of you know, Paula's work is internationally recognised and her 20 plus year career has, been in, has seen her involved in some of the most innovative projects in social arts. The first publication of bilingual Afghan women's Dubaiti literature in Australia. Her work exploring race and cultural relationships projects and have uh, supported uh, reconciliation and collaborations between refugee, migrant and indigenous woman, women. Another area is, is disability in the arts. 
Much of the work is about moving away from the deficit model through the lens of disadvantage and investing in artistic expression, engagement and experience that tr transforms lives. The Queensland Ballet Company and their partnership with Hear and Say has seen them translate the learnings from their dancer wellbeing program into partnership that has innovative implications for how hearing impaired children and young people with cochlear implants can improve communication and health outcomes through movement. A similar example, a partnership between the Tasmanian Symphony Orchestra and community arts organisation Kickstart Arts has seen a collaboration between the orchestra and Tasmanian's migrant and refugee artists and communities, which has had a huge community impact but equally important has had been transformative, transformative for a very traditional orchestra. We've been working with larger arts organisations and companies in recent years to develop the Artistic Vibrancy Framework, a structure and resources to help arts organisations reflect on their artistic achievements. There are five elements, but one of the most important and interesting is about relevance to community, and relevance is intertwined with the promotion of civility and a more thoughtful community. While I have just described a, a, a range of projects the Australia Council has supported in social community and experimental, and experimental arts, I, do not, uh, I don't do this intending to be self-congratulatory. It's part of our role. But it's much more important to think about the artists who have provided the creative impetus and a strong sense of the possibility of a better world through these ideas. The artists bring these amazing initiatives to us. It is they and the communities who join in who deserve the recognition and the continued support. We feel privileged to be the vehicle through which the community funds and supports these important creative expressions, which inspire and enrich us. While we always support art for art's sake, the emergence of creative expression that is consciously aimed at improving the way we relate to each other is a cause for celebration. Thank you. Thank you very much for that, Tiny. I, I particularly liked the reminder around the role that arts plays in driving ideas forward in formats other than just the spoken word and, and standing up on a podium and how arts can reflect ideas back to the community and that can be quite political and quite dangerous in some communities. So I also see the benefit of having a body such as the Australia Council to support work that does challenge us, uh, challenge us as a community. And I think it is actually a vital part of a democratic society that we can do that uh, freely and with the support of government organisations such as the Australia Council. Our next speaker is Professor Rosemary Johnson from the University of Technology, where she is Head of Education and Founding Director of the Australian Centre for Child and Youth Culture and Wellbeing. She leads the interdisciplinary project Literature Australia, which is an umbrella for a number of large action research projects addressing educational disadvantage. And her talk for us this, uh, this morning, we're still this morning, is entitled Civility, the Arts and Deep Literacy. Deep Literacy being an integral part of the project's run through the Centre for Child and Youth Culture and Wellbeing. Please make her welcome. It's great to be here. When I first got this, uh, saw this topic, I thought I have to explore what civility means. So I looked up some um, derivations and saw that its archaic meaning was one that was of great note to us. It, mean, it, mean, it used to mean training in the humanities and even later meant civilization, culture and good breeding. And I felt that those things were all very important um, for us to know. Uh, I also found out in the course of my research that we, it's one of Wikipedia's five pillars. Did you know that? I didn't know that. <laughs> um, the qualities of civility sort of intrigued me. Um, and a lot of people have been talking about them already. But some of the ones that really... Or, or the one that I came to is the idea of assuming good faith, of just thinking this person is operating in good faith and with that came the idea of grace and so I started to think about civility as grace, civility as grace of words, of actions and relationships and thinking about that made me think 
obviously draw all the references to grace that seemed um, relevant. And some of the ones there that I loved was the fact of indulgence and reprieve and a temporary immunity. That comes down to giving the benefit of the doubt. Again, that idea of assuming good faith. I also loved the embellishment with grace notes in music because that's even not just assuming good faith but giving a bit more in relationship, in action and in how, in how we, in the work that we do. So that related very much to the research work that I'm doing with a large number of action research fieldwork projects on deep literacy. And deep literacy is something that's come to me as a way of sort of explaining what the arts do and what literature in particular does. Deep literacy, sorry nuances literacy, we all know what literacy is, being able to read and write, speak and listen, but deep literacy is what, where literacy leads us and it, it compounds the deficit of not being literate when you think about where deep literacy can lead us, pertaining to deep thinking, to critical thinking, to wonder, to sense of ide identity beyond a single descriptor. It's essentially subjunctive. Deep literacy, being deeply literate, means that you always, in reading a book, in looking at a painting, at looking at Paula's story, at looking at the work that the National Gallery is doing in Alzheimer's, in looking at the um, possibilities for the Australia Council, that deep literacy actually is helping us to think about how would I feel? That's subjunctive. What if that were me? What if that was my mother? What if that was my f that were that were my father? What if this were my house? So that essentially subjunctive type of thinking, and that it's this sort of thinking that develops. And this is part of our banner: develops personal and communal behaviours that generate creative and civil society. Because I think civility goes hand in hand with with um, creativity. It affects how we do what and how, what we do what we do and how we do it as members as individuals as members of family and as members of a nation. The opening sentences of Tim Winton's book Cloud Street, that lovely, generous picture of coming to of eccentricity and difference and diversity and all the things that have been talked about today, coming together in this these beautiful opening sentences. Will you look at us by the river, the whole restless mob of us on spread blankets in the dreamy, briny sunshine, skylarking and chayaking about for one day, one good, one clear, sorry, one clean, clean, sweet day in a good world in the midst of our living. And I think that difference between if critical literacy is looking at the text and exploring what the text does, deep literacy is what we do away from the text. Deep literacy is how that affects us and it doesn't only mean in this world texts are not only written texts of course, art is a text, screen is a text, anything that communicates intent is a text. So, and I won't go linger on, the, on these because you've... Um, We've talked about them, people have talked about them, the, the capacity of the arts to do all these wonderful things. Again, I love T.S. Eliot. I think the arts stimulate our thinking. They stimulate our thoughts. They stimulate us as, as creative, thinking, critical individuals, graceful individuals. And T.S. Eliot said, thoughts subtly impact the, the person who thinks them. And I think that's such a great um, quote. By the way, I've got... Uh, a handout that pr was prepared if anybody wants to get any of these quotes. There, it's, it's out the front, I think. So, um, the arts explore the complex density of the human predicament. They stimulate and inspire responsive creativity. And this is something I really want to stress. Uh, I was just mentioning this to Donald before because I'm saying that the arts actually make us, even if we don't actually do 
the artistic work. We participate in, in it by the responses that we make to it. And so creati creativity, I think, is contagious. It's active, it's vicarious. It jumps from one thought to another, from one mind to another, from one imagination to another, from one mode of expression to another. How often, if you, if you like writing and writing poetry, you see an artwork and you want to go and create that artwork or something that that artwork stimulated in you in words. So I think that um, that is that essential generation of creativity in people who actually are looking at the art and watching the, 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 the drama and listening to the music is part of that creative and part, certainly part of being a creative nation. I mentioned the field work that I've been doing. Um, oh, I, I do want, sorry, did I just jump then? Did I jump before? Yeah, sorry. Okay. What does it do? And I loved, I've loved this quote from Kristeva. It's very long to have there. I'm not going to read it to you. Julie Kristeva, a, a critical theorist, a psychoanalyst, who had this to say about forgiveness because I think the arts help us to have that assumption of grace towards each other. The arts help us to become a giving nation in what we do and how we do it. And when we're giving, we are also forgiving it's easier to forgive. And I think that's part of the distinctiveness that as a nation we want to work, work towards. And I think we have it in, in some of these beautiful programs is showing the work that so many people are doing in um, trying to make things better and trying to move on. And Chris Davis says, forgiveness breaks the concatenation of causes and effects crimes and punishment, it stays the time of actions. It allows us to um, ad adopt the bonds with love as a principle of renewal, both of self and other. And I just urge you to read that through at, at your convenience and time and just ponder on those words. George Steiner said, we are an animal, that is humans, whose life breath is that of spoken, painted, sculptured, sung dreams. And then, again, because the arts are essentially transdisciplinary. The arts don't just... Reading a novel doesn't just sit in literature. Reading a novel is part of life. Looking at an artwork doesn't just sit in art, it sits in life, it sits in where we are. So... Um, I, I love this idea. This is, this is um, a, a scientist talking about string theory and he's, he's painting a picture in words just as perhaps a poet might do. Uh, what appears to be different elementary particles are actually different notes on a fundamental string. The universe is akin to a cosmic symphony. And then... What happens after I read that? One of my lovely PhD students, I'm talking to her, I can't help being enthusiastic about this, talking to her, she's an Indigenous lady, and she said to me, Rosemary, ancestor beings made a noise. The noise became singing, and the singing created landforms and themselves as being. You dream, you sing, it is. So it's part of that. that the arts are connectors. They're deep, deep, deep connectors to who we are as human beings, who we are as diverse human beings, celebrating that diverseness. Okay, I've, this all started, well, it didn't all start, it started many years ago, but the field work that I'm doing now at the University of Technology, Sydney, started with an ARC project which we called New Ways of Doing School, Using Story and Technology to Generate Innovative Learning, Cultural and Social Environments. And that New Ways project has gone from being one project and exploded into many. We went, we've been all over, not all over, we've been to many parts of regional Australia. We went to the Pilbara. In the Pilbara, we were asked by the Madhu peoples to help them as they help their, their children try to hang on to the culture that they have, their own culture, as well as become part of the culture that is very distant. 
when you're in the middle of the Pilbara or in the middle of the Western um, Desert Lands. So we started implementing programs at the university. This was the first one, but they grew, um, that were actually using the arts as part of engaging exceptionally disengaged youth. Um, kids, some of the kids in our programs are one step away from a juvenile detention centre. Um, the first one was the New Ways, and New Ways has become a bit of a theme um, for us. It's been something about the a an agent of social change. What we've been trying to, to talk about, what we've been trying to show the kids that are part of our program, that there are new ways of being. You don't have to be limited to how you think you have to be that there are many, many diverse ways of being and those ways are open to them. There's new ways of doing, there's new ways of dreaming and there's new ways of thinking. And I can't tell you all the details of the programs but basically what we are trying to do is to expand horizons of thinking, to create new ideas, to create with kids who think that school has failed them, they hate it, they're never there, that their families often have failed them, that actually there, there is still an agency that they can take in their life. So we expose them to as many, many experiences as we can and we follow that up with mentoring in the school. That grew into one project with Aboriginal and Indigenous kids in year nine and 10. We have been amazingly lucky. We have now got funding of almost $2 million from corporate philanthropy, which has just been allowed us to grow um, these programs. And you can tell that I'm deeply, deeply <laughs> committed to these programs. That's the Indigenous one. You can see some of the things that we were doing. New ways of being, creative futures, a different way of giving confidence. Then the next one, we thought, okay, this is working. So we decided to go for the communities of Greater Sydney, um, years seven and eight, where there's a high Muslim community. And you can see that was a, that painting was an artwork in last year's Nobel, um, Nobel. <laughs> last year's, it's gone out of my head. The Archibald, yes, the Archibald Prize. And it happened to be of a, a boy band called Boy and Bear. So we had all the kids and we played the song that they had sung, which of course was tapping into their world. Then we showed them this painting, then we took them to the art gallery. Then this young fellow who had done the painting said, do you, do you want to do some portrait painting? Do you want to, want to have a go at doing this? And he did it. And these kids have, we've now gone into the schools. We're now reaching around about um, 300 kids in this program by going into the schools and taking these inspired artists, he's also a teacher, uh, into the school and working with the kids uh, in the school, which is also professional development of the teachers. Lockhart River, going up to the Lockhart River, I haven't got time to show you, we created a wonderful little film. We told them they were going to be stars of their own movie and they were. So, the hard stuff. We're creating new arts methodologies out of this. We have a new, a new arts methodology that we're writing about, that we're working on at the, mo at the moment. We want to provoke new axiologies of practice. Axiologies are, are sort of current logics of how we think. We see that disadvantage is socially constructed in many ways. Uh, the way that a school is organised, the, the curriculum that's on a school, the, the things that we make kids learn, sometimes those things are helping to construct disadvantage. How can we do better than that? And cultural epistemologies, ontologies, arts creating futures is our theme. So I just want you to indulge me by reading with me these words of Tim Winton's um, Cloud Street. Will you look at us by the river? Everybody. Will you look at us by the river? The whole restless mob of us on spread blankets in the dreamy, briny sunshine, skylarking and chayaking about for one day, one clear, clean, sweet day in a good world in the midst of our living. And for me, I think that the most significant things that the arts do is that they play out the great human mystery. They play out the complexity of us as mortals, as us of being aware that our time here is short. 
in the whole scheme of things. And they ge generate that civility of spirit, generos generosity of soul and grace in knowledge. But most of all, I think they give us, just as religions do, they give us a sense and a hope and a dream and sometimes an assurance of something more. Thank you. Thank you, Rosemary, and thank you for leading us all in uh, that little bit of uh, spoken word art as we read from Tim Winton's book. As you can certainly see, arts is fundamental to all of the panel members today, and we see it every day, we live it every day, and Rosemary it was sharing how it can be expanded across a range of disciplines to connect a whole lot of different things together, the, the personal and the communal seen through art. Our next speaker is Bernice Murphy, who comes from a long background in art, particularly contemporary art and museums, and is currently National Director of Museums Australia. Her talk for us this afternoon is entitled Down with Ornamentalism, the Arts as Generators, Generators of Social Development and Social Community. Please make her welcome. Thank you, and thank you, Chas. Greetings to everyone. I met with Auntie Agnes Shea coming in this morning and had an opportunity to thank her for her welcome. Welcome, Canberra Grammar. Wonderful to see you here, and a special apology. Um, if I'd had another different 10 minutes from these, I'd have written about youth culture, uh, because my whole notion of culture and where the arts sit include all ages and all kinds, including popular culture. Brief introduction, I've got a tight paper and images uh, because I want to counter through this. But I was thinking when Rosemary was speaking and talking about the etymology um, of civility, I was thinking the etymology of uh, culture itself, which comes from the idea of cultivating a common community. Originally, it goes all the way back to agrarian communities when people live together in a common territory. And that idea travels through time. It gets associated with cultivated, high cultural forms, and it comes through today with a much, we tend to expand it to a much broader anthropological idea of everything that we do in life, when we begin to speak, follow gesture, when a baby observes a gesture, starts to hear sound and hears a pattern of sound, acquires language, interaction with a family, we are laying the basis, bases of social community and we are engaged in culture. We are enter culture the moment we enter language. So my idea of culture is absolutely broad. I think we should do like sporting advocacy, make it as broad as possible, include everybody, and then you can work back to certain kinds of specific performance, perhaps elite performance, which everyone happily accepts in sport because the basis of physical activity is so broadly understood. So I would like, always in thinking about the arts, to ground that thought in a very broad understanding of culture itself. And I thought today, because you can only ever take a small path through a, a big topic or landscape in 10 minutes, that in terms of culture and the arts role in civility, one of the very interesting and vibrant topics is the way in which our arts, first mainstream and excluding indigenous culture, came to imagine relationships at first very awkwardly and gradually pressing further and eventually including indigenous artists, performers, culture, people, communities, has brought one of the most important changes in our lives about the whole notion and grounding of civility in a social contract. Now I'm going to race. Lots of slides. Um, I'm not identifying them all because it just takes too much time for my purposes. Uh, this is my idea of culture, not linear, not separated in time, always interactive, 
we create forms, we experience them at the same time, unless one is autistic, we have an audience, so culture's moving into experience. It deepens into interpretation when we know certain kinds of rock songs have a history going back to the 60s or 50s, whenever. And in that deeper interpretation, we understand that Shakespeare was a person living in time and relates to the time before him, and we place him with times after. That's a deeper interpretation. And in those processes, and they're all moving at, together at all times, we are also preserving the things that strengthen us. Aboriginal society does this, all communities. My model is for all communities at all times, and it's all happening interactively at all times. So, let's celebrate um, two women artists very currently, Fiona Hall. Really, her career makes up to the rich the varied body of achievements that really merit an AO, which she was announced as um, entering the Order of Australia with the title AO last week. And we also celebrate Simran Gill right now. Recently, her show opened in Venice, where the roof was taken off our pavilion so that water drops in and the works on the wall will be subject to the forces of nature, while the Biennale of Venice is on this year. Recent discussions about cultural policy often pointed to a cleavage between support for the arts' intrinsic values versus an emphasis on their instrumental outcomes in the so-called creative industries. However, to my mind, stress on intrinsic worth often leaves the arts in a passive position, as small players, seemingly, in civil society. For me, the real struggle is between regarding our arts as merely ornamental in our social life, rather than as deep literacy <laughs> purveyors as critical generators of social learning, innovation, creativity, our capacity for empathy to pick up other ideas that have been brought forward, and the rich dynam dynamics of identity. The arts play a powerful role in both national self-understanding, as we know, and in our interface with the world internationally. Art images mold our sense of the past, and our common experience in the journey of nation. In the 19th century, 19th and early 20th centuries, paintings of settler society, him a coven on the left and street on the right, image the progress of a people in a land that was already possessed intergenerationally, but often still daunting and other in its forces of nature. In the modernist language of the 20th century, Nolan's Kelly dominates an open mythic landscape of human action. It's a dominated landscape while his ghostly Burke is overcome at Cooper's Creek by the implacable interior. However, our artists also begin to probe further, and these same artists, uh, Nolan in particular, changing stereotypes of place and history. Margaret Preston's Shoalhaven pictures, which you see on the left, are derived from Aboriginal bark painting. She traveled to the far north and experienced Aboriginal culture in Arnhem Land. And Nolan's snake, though he less understood, he, le he was less exposed directly to Aboriginal culture at all. Nolan's snake, now at Hobart, Hobart's Mona, figures a huge rainbow serpent winding across its one, 1,620 units. Both these artists had journeyed north and um, into central Australia, producing works that reshaped Australian arts resources through new ideas of our relationship to the land and to a starkly ancient cultural heritage. Still very awkwardly understood, but there is a pressing there towards a different sense of where we are, how we are to live in this continent, and here I'm stressing the role of the arts as purveying, pressing forward ideas beyond the mainstream and being critical generators of social development. However, this still excluded the deepest aspirations of Aboriginal art and ancestral authority, denying its custodians both their own cultural continuity and social agency. When this Arnhem Land bark painting was collected on an Australian-American scientific expedition in 1948, way up in the north, um, the adaptive continuity of urban and rural indigenous Australians was still deeply obscured at the, and uh, 
Aboriginal Australians lived at the margins of cities and towns, often even hidden, obscured in their survival and continuity in the outback itself. On the right, an important image of William Barak, painting a corroboree scene, in fact, um, of the Corrindirk community um, east of Melbourne. Near, not far, I remember visiting that area, near where Nellie Bell Melbourne had her house, in fact. Arthur Boyd, profoundly affected by his first, deeply moral man, Arthur Boyd, profoundly affected by his first journey to Alice Springs, deeply troubled he was to see Aboriginal people on trains and how they were so much shrinking from mainstream society, feeling so unwelcome. Arthur Boyd imagined real human experience beneath this deep social divide, producing stirring images in his late 50s half-cast bride series of the shadowed aspects of civil society's exclusionary contract with nationhood. Meanwhile, the actual voices of urban and rural Aboriginal experience were yet to surface as they did eventually in vivid images which appeared decades later, just two examples, Robert Campbell Jr. on the left, getting Cobra and Ian Abdallah about rural fruit picking here often and here fishing in rural Australia. Australia's national self-imagery, its narrative of progress strengthened by federation, was haunted by two spectres. On one hand, the repressed memory of Aboriginal colonization, dispossession, and frontier violence. On the other, the endurance and survival of Indigenous Australians, who'd been given no place at all at the table of civil society. Historically, their social development had been relegated to scientific study in natural history museums, and their cultural imagery had been treated as a primitive ornament and prelude to Euro-Australian artistic development. Australian artists, meanwhile, reached beyond the European inheritance to try to incorporate aspects of Indigenous culture and rethink our history. But the chasm in real social contact, contact often pr produced results that were ludicrous. John Antill, whom I'm now mentioning, is not ludicrous, but some, an aspect of his corroboree clearly is. For example, John Antill's corroboree is still stirring. It's uh, still stirring, a very important symphonic work of the 40s. It was launched as a ballet in Sydney in 1950 with 30 Anglo-Australian dancers improbably skin-painted up in black to represent Aboriginal Australians in enacting their most sacred ceremonial life. In fact, the varied forms of this universalized corroboree were still richly alive in, in remote communities, for example, in Arnhem Land, far away from mainstream access. That's a much more recent image of a Gunapipi ceremony in Arnhem Land on the right. Consider the remarkable achievement across six decades in the generative power of the arts, the arts as generators today, to provide images of profound change in our society and our civil contract with our whole community. Witness Bangara's new ballet Black currently at the Sydney Opera House and note Bangara's own sources in the far north here, just an example from the Mornington Island dance performance, while also Bangara has imprinted our consciousness with new urban imagery. In music, another transformation of cross-cultural potential can be traced in Peter Sculthorpe's quest over decades to incorporate indigenous references from 72, 73, Rites of Passage um, through Kakadu for the 1988 Bicentenary to a recent collaboration, wonderful <laughs> collaboration with one of our greatest didgeridoo Yudaki players, William Barton. I heard him for the first time in a small area in Queensland in 2006. It was just unforgettable to be with him playing. This interaction in Sculthorpe's 2004 Requiem in Adelaide also marks a new phase in our creative development when indigenous artists themselves are free to collaborate with ancient classical Western music often or pop popular cultural forms or any forms of their choice. Or in Barton's words, I'm doing what I love. I want to take the oldest culture in the world and blend it with Europe's rich musical legacy. We could trace similar transformations in literature from Mary Dirac's Kings in Grass Castles, 59, based on her family's history in the Kimberley, to Kim Scott's That Dead Man, 
Dead Man Dance, a, a marvelous novel for the sense of empathy towards the two cultures depicted in a tragic history that he deals with south near Alb Albany. We could trace it in Xavier Herbert's Capricornia, background through to Alexis Wright's Carpentaria, both of the indigenous writers being recent winners of the Miles Franklin Award. I also give you The Secret River. I I, and, and just note that the in except for uh, the woman speaking in English as a kind of Greek chorus figure, the men and boys speak in Darug, a, si a local Sydney language. Unimaginable decades ago. Unimaginable. Such historical working in fiction and theatre enables us to reimagine the stories of our history in multiple voices and a myriad alternative possibilities, challenging the often violent condensation of events that weigh so heavily in the actuality of our past. By the way, just witness what happened in, re in remote northern communities. I showed you that small bark from 48. Look what happened when John Marwinjal, still living, could come out and he had this spectacular presence in the Biennale of Sydney of 2000. And he's gone on to do a work in the bookshop. Um, it's the roof and a distant column in the Musée du Cap in Paris. There he is in front of the Eiffel Tower. Think of the remarkable, a woman began painting in her 80s, Emily Kunware. Look at the extraordinary range of language, of touch, of visual imagery. Just almost impossible to uh, explain. Before she died, in about 10 years, she had just transformed painting in this country. Of course, if I were going more broadly, I'd think of Chinese Australians like Guan Wei, ASEAN, or currently performing William Yang. I'd include um, Im other immigrant artists like uh, Juan de Villa, Imanz Tillers. One, that's Juan de Villa collaborating with the late, tragically dead Howard Arkley. Imanz Tillers of Latvian background. Notice how they all break up imagery and use so many elements. It's all part of a, a process of breaking up and refitting ideas about history. The wonderful Norel Jubilin work dealing with Mawson. Uh, and in the central image there, um, it's an image from that Corrindirk, Corrindirk community east of Melbourne, Barracks people whom I uh, showed you earlier. And we wouldn't forget the always in century um, Richard Bell, Queensland, um, with his uh, rituals, he's always mocking our indigenous accommodation with his makeover urban regalia. We wouldn't forget Fiona Foley's confidence as a contemporary budgeter woman from Fraser Island, challenging mainstream histories. Last, if, can I have just one more minute? Will you allow me? Okay. <laughs> I just want to deal with this aspect. We've talked about civility very much around ideas of courtesy, and they are such precious ideas. But my last point is that the arts, in their tr traditional deep cultural role, deal with all kinds of things that do not happen within a present actual society. They deal with violence and all of the ideas of which and actions of which human beings are capable. It's through this extension into unsanctioned territories and forbidden territories that we expand our notion of what we are as human beings and rethink our relationship and our social contract with inner society. And uh, as we see with Boyd's expulsion from paradise, uh, Juan de Villa's work, by the way, ran, uh, stepped in and told the police to get that work back into the Biennale of Sydney in 82. They had no business seizing it. Complex story there. But in the recent case of Bill Henson, civility, civility failed. It shows how civility can break under pressure when it comes to very difficult areas of, of uh, vibrant social contemporary interest. But Bill Henson was subjected to appalling, appalling mocking abuse in that case um, in 2008. And I leave you with this current image on, in performance now of the maids of Genet. It, it deals with absolutely uncivil uh, behavior. It, it, it's one of these works that deals with 
all kinds of territories with which the arts in their full cultural expansion must deal in order to give us that vital reflection back on the reality and the kinds of accommodations we make in supporting the civil society in which we live. Thank you. Thank you, Bernice, for showing us that great uh, snapshot of Australian history through art and art in Australian history with all of those different images and uh, thinking about where we then sit in the world with our art and then with our society. I look to the organisers in that we have used our allotted time and we haven't had any questions. So would you like me to let the panel loose into lunch and have them mobbed for questions or would you like to... We have time for two. So less mobbing <laughs> at lunch, more discussion here. So does anybody have any questions about arts and civility for our panel members? Oh, so you're all hungry. I shouldn't have mentioned the word lunch. Well, I'm going to say now you can't have any lunch until you ask a question. <laughs> well, you're the educators. <laughs> no? Okay. Oh, we have, we have two. We have one right at the back and then one here and there are two. Hi. Hi, my name is Julian Jeffries. I'm from Camel Grammar School. I'm loosely in charge of these young students <laughs> here. My question, I guess it's sort of been answered by the topic of what you've been talking about, but I find it hard um, convincing young people who are highly practical in the way that they see the world to value the arts. And I wondered if you had any particular insights into how to convince people to be involved um, and to see worth in the arts when, when they're sort of always asking that question, oh, what, what, what's the point, where, how am I going to get ahead, how is this going to help me in the future? Um, and while we've got them here as a captive audience, maybe you can help me in my job. So, who wants to demonstrate the value of the arts? <coughs> oh, there we go. Oh, there we, there we. Take, take it out. Um, look, it's a very good question, and we uh, get it, obviously, you know, he hear it all the time. I think it's deep immersion. I think you have to absolutely persevere and expose young people and students to every possible form of artistic expression and creativity. I think you have to engage with some of the best artists um, and uh, just get them to talk about their practice and their... Um, uh, and their art. I mean, there's many examples of um, uh, artists in schools program, but personally, I'm a, I'm a great advocate of in situ experiences. My, my personal experience, my earliest recollections were of arts experiences, seeing an orchestra for the first time, going to the National Gallery uh, and just being exposed, you know, being exposed to it. And, and they will, it's audience investment for the future for those organisations, but it's, um, it has profound impacts, I, I think. So I think it's just deep, deep immersion and perseverance. I'd just like to make a comment as well. I run each January a youth program called the Summer Scholarship and um, part of the evaluation of that program now includes a question to the students how they think um, their engagement with the visual arts actually assists their study in other subjects. And it has been really interesting over the last five years when I've been asking that question how students have responded. But students seem to me to be much more canny these <laughs> days about understanding the value of creativity, of innovation, of needing to be able to think, you know, outside the square and find solutions to things. Um, and so, I mean, I would say bring them to the gallery. <laughs> um, but I would also say that you need to be talking about it more. You need to be advocates as teachers for the value of the arts and for the value of that ex uh, aesthetic experience. I say to my kids, you know, it's all very well studying what you're doing now, but, you know, what's going to make you happy? <laughs> and, and one last little bit uh, from Paula. From a community worker perspective, I guess, um, I, you know, I think it's... It's always a challenge for me. It's about facilitating creativity. And quite often in... I'll just give you a story. I worked on a, a project with young Muslim women. It was an animation project. And we brought um, five different artists in, digital artists, media artists, visual artists, um, writers, and um, provided the space for young women to find how they wanted to express themselves. So it was 
expression from the ground up rather than imposition. You have to be creative. And one of the young women created a beautiful collage for one of the backdrops for the um, a scene in the animation. And everyone was saying, that's just really beautiful. It's so creative. And she said, you know, I've never been creative before. No one's ever told me I'm creative. And I asked her, I said, don't you do art at school? And she said, but we're not allowed to be creative in art. And I think perhaps one of the problems with art is it gets disconnected and siloed off outside all other learning. So creativity should be part of every discipline, every subject. It shouldn't be disconnected from all other learning processes. And I think that's the problem. But my first question as a community worker is what do you want to do? What do you want to say? So I sort of, um, I think that's a really important question. What, how, what people or young people want to actually do themselves. And, well, while we're getting, yes. Oh, sorry. Rosemary, does yeah, that one Just work? a very quick one. Can you hear me? Yes. Um, the, the most important thing is to meet them where they're at. Um, the kids, particularly the kids that I'm dealing with in these, pro, in these programs pro, and projects, uh, have a great interest in, in, in art, in arts, the arts. They have an interest in pop culture. They have an interest in song, in, in pop songs. And we've developed from that an interest in words and an interest in, in creating their own story. Somebody, Paula, I think, said um, something about story, the, the essence of story. We, we talk about the idea of story arts. How does a story become art? You live it, you tell it, and someone listens. And we just try to say, we'll listen to you in any, in any way that you would like to tell us this story. Mm -hmm. So I think we have found that rather than the arts being a problem, we don't call it the arts. We don't probably ever use that term. But rather than the arts being a problem for us, we have found that this is the way to actually get the kids engaged in the other parts of the curriculum. Um, we have found that, that this is the way that we have been able to start them on the long, long track of social engagement and school engagement. Not in all cases and not perfectly, but enough for us to know that it's working. And really, I think as Rosemary was saying, it is about seeing the art in the everyday. That the music that we listen to, the books that we read, the movies that we watch and the, the TV shows that we watch to a certain extent can involve artistic and creativity. And uh, it, it happens all around us as we live and breathe. If we recognise it as such, then we're more likely to want to be part of it and see more of it. We did have one more question here, and it's going to be a short question, and we're going to have short answers. <laughs> and we'll make this an art form. Can we answer in... <laughs> Well, limerick form, because that's only <laughs> six lines? No? Mo anyway. <laughs> yeah, uh, myself, Ram Gautam. I, my, I have one question to Dr. Paula Abud. Mm -hmm. I want to know the uh, power of the art to reform the antisocial elements, whether she has any experience to reform the person who, who, who are put behind the bars or something else, or they have been uh, then uh, brought back to the mainstream. Talking about socially excluded or people who are yeah. outside social. Those those are, uh, those people who are anti-social elements, okay. uh, uh, and uh, the, the re reformation uh, the art has brought in them mm -hmm. to make them uh, to bring them in the mainstream of the country. Okay. Um, I guess in terms of language, I, I guess in community work we talk about socially excluded rather than, I mean, I know in a lot of policy it's seen as antisocial, but I always look for reasons why people are perhaps engaging at at-risk behaviours um, that would be maybe called antisocial. And um, I don't ever try and reform anybody. Uh, community cultural development work is about getting people into a safe creative space where they get to tell their story and perhaps we look for answers and ways of um, um, working with that person in partnership, in a respectful sort of partnership quite often. You know, I've seen a lot of projects where people even come into those spaces and still feel they have no agency and no space to really tell their story. So for me it's about a, a relationship you build with often marginalised individuals who no one's ever, they've never had any respect, no one's ever actually listened to them, even though they get asked what's wrong, what's going on, and no one actually listens. Listening is a real art. Listening respectfully and actively and reflectively 
is probably the most important skill in community culture work. And I think it happens after that because you create trust and you nurture. And I, I don't, I've never had a, a space where that hasn't happened because that's what you work towards. Thank you. So that ends our panel discussion as part of this forum on civility and the arts. And I wanted to leave you with some words that uh, are currently driving our creative and artistic policy here in Australia. For a number of years, we've been talking about a national cultural policy. As, as Bernice talked about, cultural uh, culture is a very broad term. And for a long time, we have been without a, a driving document to articulate where we want to go with our artistic and cultural endeavours here in Australia as an artistic community. Our cultural policy was uh, launched in March under the title of Creative Australia. And it states that a strong, creative and inclusive culture strengthens Australian values and is a central component to our being in charge of our own, of our own destiny. Culture is not created by government, but enabled by it. Culture is created by community. So hopefully we can reflect about arts in their place in their community, in our civil society, but also how civil society itself drives arts, drives creativity and drives culture. Thank you very much. I hand you back to our forum chair, who's going to have some housekeeping about how we're going to eat our lunch in an artistic way. <laughs> Thanks, Roslyn, and, uh, and thanks to our panellists. I think, I think the uh, presentations went right to the heart of what chat is about, what, what makes us human. And, uh, and I guess I'd just like to say, particularly uh, addressing the end of Paula's uh, presentation, that uh, a few years ago, back in England, I had the privilege of working with a charity which placed refugees in universities. And there's no doubt in my mind that most of the people that we place would be dead had we not placed them. And they're now making a, 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 a wonderful contribution to the British economy. So it's, it's a no-brainer. So let's hope that one day someone will take the risk of thinking there are more votes in being humanitarian than there are in treating the victims as if they were the criminals. <laughs>